What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Ardell, and some of you may have seen our recent video on the hippopotamus defense and its theory, but in today's video, we're not just going to be covering the strategy, moves, lines, and theory, but really see this opening in action at the master level. Many people, when they see the hippo, think that it's a very slow, defensive, and passive opening, and honestly, I totally understand this assumption. I mean, when you first look at the setup, basically what we're going to do is fianchetto both our bishops, putting them on g7 and b7 and we're also going to put our pawns on e6 and d6 and then tuck the knights closely behind and then following that we have the option of playing moves like a6 and h6 and really by doing this we're trying to lock down this fifth rank of the board forming a wall that is very hard for white to break through and then after that we're not going to play slow and passive chess but very aggressive moves breaking the position open potentially g5 as well as f5 and the very common c5 and what i really like about the hippo is that usually white's going to play moves like e4 and d4 and then when we break through with moves like f5 and c5, at least one of our bishops, if not both, are going to become extremely aggressive attacking pieces. So far, I've shown you about 107 arrows and no moves. So let's hop into the game. The game we're about to cover was played by Genry Chapukaitis back in the year of 1996, and he brilliantly showed how to play the hippo defense with aggressive attacking chess. The game started off with d4, and we now see Gunry continue with g6. And after e4, bishop g7. This is usually how people go into the hippo defense with the modern defense. I mean, g6, bishop g7, putting pressure on d4. This is probably the best way to start it off. And following knight f3, we now see d6, followed by a6. Honestly, up to this point, this seems pretty standard for the modern defense. But now after a4, we see the move b6. And honestly, I really like this b6 move. The reason we have to play this right now is because white would love to play the move a5, in which case we couldn't play b6 or even b5 without a takes b6 being an option. Now with b6, if white does play a5, we have the opportunity to play b5 and keep our pawn structure intact. Here we see white continue with h3, preventing our bishop from coming to g4, but we're not going to put our bishop on g4 and instead fianchetto it later on in this game on b7. And now after e6, we see white play bishop g5, attacking the queen on d8. One thing I recommend to hippo defense players is to not put the knight on e7 right away. What do I mean by this? Well, if we don't put our knight on e7, white is going to be tempted to play bishop g5, in which case now we can play knight e7. And if white wants to give up the bishop at move 7 in this game, taking the knight on e7, giving us more room to operate, and giving us the bishop pair advantage going forward, we are completely okay with this. And the next move, we're going to continue with h6, which we were going to play anyways, now forcing the bishop to take our knight on e7, which again, we're completely okay with, or going back to f4, in which case white just lost a tempo. We're now going to play bishop b7, and after bishop e2, we see Gunnery continue with knight d7. We now see the hippopotamus defense setup with both of our fianchetto bishops, a knight on e7 and d7, and white continues by playing rook d1. Now, I know some of you are probably wondering, and for very good reason, how on earth can this setup be aggressive? Well, here, white seems to have the more aggressive setup. I mean, white has a pawn on e4, d4, a queen on d2, and rook on d1, ready, locked, and loaded on this d-file. But now, with our bishops on g7 and b7, putting pressure on e4 and d4, we're going to break this game open and play attacking chess, starting off with the move g5. I really like this idea, especially when the bishop is on f4. Notice how white just lost two tempos. White put the bishop on g5, so we played h6, kicking the bishop back, and then g5 again, kicking the bishop back to e3. White would have been much better off just by playing bishop e3 right away, and we're now going to continue with f5, breaking through the king side of the board, putting pressure on e4, and with our bishop on b7 attacking that pawn, we see white take the pawn on f5, in which case we now have knight takes f5, activating our knight, attacking e3 and d4 with our knight, our bishop on g7, and on top of that, our bishop on b7 is attacking the knight on f3, which is defending 
the pawn on d4. Now here I think white's best option would probably be to simply castle kingside, play bishop c4, and put some pressure on e6. But here white realized that the bishop on e3 was very awkwardly placed. So here white played queen d3, followed by bishop c1, getting the bishop out of range. And honestly, in terms of chess strategy, this does make some sense. I mean, our rook is already on d1. The rook's not on a1, so it's not going to be trapped in. And this bishop on c1 is still somewhat active. At least it's not any worse than it was on e3, as it still attacks that g5 pawn. But the problem with playing queen d3 followed by bishop c1 is it gave black too much time. And now we're going to continue with c5, an extremely common idea in in the hippo breaking this game open again i mean we have our knight on f5 bishop on g7 and bishop on b7 just causing havoc right in the center of the board so white really didn't have much of a choice but to take the pawn on c5 in which case we now see knight takes c5 attacking the queen on d3 the only two safe squares for white are d2 and c4 so we see white go with the better option of queen c4 a much more active option attacking our pawn on e6 but we now see rook c8 and honestly this is just good fundamental chess in the game of chess we want to put our rooks on open files where none of our pawns are in the way on a8, the rook really wasn't doing a ton, as its scope was limited to a6, but now with the rook on c8, there's no pawns in the way. We're putting direct vision on the queen on c4, and you never know when things are going to break open or we have a tactic available. Here white played h4, actually the best move, and out of mere desperation, I mean going a move back, we have an extremely active position with a knight on f5, c5, two bishops, on b7 and g7 and two rooks on open files with c8 and f8 this is a beautiful setup for black so here white decided to try to create some kind of counterplay with h4 one thing that the hippo player has to be careful of at least in this case with playing g5 is yes we did get an active position but now our pawns are a little bit exposed and actually this h4 move almost works but the problem is that we have a bishop on b7 ready to play bishop takes f3 removing the defender of the pawn on h4 and after d takes f3 we now have knight takes h4 a very active knight attacking that f3 pawn as well as our rook so we see the move queen g4 defending the pawn on f3 and still attacking our somewhat vulnerable pawn on e6 now in this position the knight on h4 is a pretty active piece attacking that f3 pawn but some of you may have heard the term the knight on the rim is dim right now this knight is attacking this f3 pawn but besides that it's only attacking three squares right now this knight on the very edge of the board doesn't have a ton of activity as its scope is limited to g6 f5 f3 and g7 where could this knight be better placed well we see black play knight g6 followed by knight e5 why would black do this well by putting our knight on e5 the knight is a much more centralized and active piece in the game we want to put our knights in the center of the board because they attack more squares bishops are a little bit different i mean this bishop on c1 would be the exact same as a bishop on d2 as it's attacking this long term diagonal but in general knights belong in the center of the board so we see knight g6 followed by knight e5 attacking the queen on g4 and the pawn on f3 and following queen h3 we now see the move g4 some may be tempted to play knight takes e4 but the slight problem with this is that white has an in-between move with queen takes e6 check attacking our king followed by taking the knight i still think that black is better there but we see a much better option from black with g the whole point of this is to limit white's scope of the pawn on e6, and if white takes the pawn, we're simply going to win a knight right in the center of the board. If white tries to complete a Hail Mary play with something like bishop takes h6, you know, trying to really weaken the position of our king, we're completely okay after knight takes f2, attacking the queen on h3, both of the white rooks. And if white plays a move like queen g2, we'll just take that rook off the board. And here after a move like queen f6, I mean queen f2 ideas are in the air, we're still attacking that c2 pawn, here black has a completely one game. So white was smart not to take that pawn, and instead play the move queen h5, in which case we now see black take that knight on e4. Now I personally 
in this position probably would have just took the pawn on c2. I mean, this looks like the obvious move, but here Gunry came up with a very nice intermediate move option with queen f6. First off, defending the pawn on h6, but more importantly, attacking this pawn on f2, creating a queen takes f2 check threat. And now after a move like rook h2, we then take the pawn on c2. Notice how our queen is not on d8, but is now on f6, defending the pawn, attacking the pawn on f2, and then after this, we put our rook on c2, a very active piece. Here white continued with bishop takes h6, and black could have took the bishop on h6 and went into the endgame a pawn ahead, but here black saw an option to hunt down the enemy king on e1 and played rook takes e2 check. An amazing move. Following king takes e2, we now have queen f3 with check. Now here white has a few options. Obviously if king f1 we simply win the rook on d1. Now white played king e1 but why didn't white just play king d2? This seems to maybe work but now we have the move queen d3 check. If king e1 we have knight f3 checkmate game over and if king c1 we have rook c8 checkmate game over. Let's go home. So white trying to hold on to this game played king e1 and we now see another crazy move from black g3 breaking this game open attacking the rook on h2. Now in the game white played bishop takes g7 but let's go over a couple of interesting options with f takes g3 and queen takes f3. What happens if white takes the queen on f3? Well, the problem with this is, yes, black's attacking chances just got dwindled, but we're now going to go and do a winning endgame simply by taking that queen with check, attacking the king. After a move like king e2, we're going to take that rook, and if a move like bishop takes g7, we're going to take that bishop off the board, and we're now threatening knight g1, cutting off the rook from h1, in which case we would then promote. So here, rook h1 is more or less forced, and we're now simply going to be able to play moves like king g6, king g5, king f4, take the pawn on e4, and if white's king tries to get active on this side of the board, we could even just run in and attack the rook on h1. This is simply a one game. You get the point. What about the move f takes g3? Why didn't white just take the pawn on g3? Well, the reason is now black has a forced mate with queen f1 check forcing the king to d2, queen d3 check, and now if king e1, we have rook f1 checkmate, game over, and following king c1, we slide our rook through, and after rook c2, just take that rook, let's go home. So white was actually smart to not take the queen on f3 or take the pawn on g3, but instead played bishop takes g7. And at least for a second, it may appear as if black might be in a little bit of trouble, but black is fearless here, by playing g takes h2, now threatening to make a second queen. And the reason I said that black may seem as if it's in a little trouble is now white has this queen h8 check idea, and after king f7, queen takes f8 with check. If you look at the position here, black is down a rook, but we see king g6, the king going all the way out here, and now white continuing with the move king d2. What happens if white just takes the queen on f3? I mean, why wouldn't you want to trade down if you're a rook ahead? Well, now we have knight takes f3 with check. If king f1, we simply make a queen, and if king e2, we now continue with knight g1 check attacking the king. If rook takes g1, we make a queen. And if white doesn't take the knight, we make a queen on h1. The pawn defends the knight, and the knight defends the pawn. So here white didn't take the queen because of this entire knight takes f3 followed by knight g1 idea being protected by the pawn and protecting the pawn. So here white played king d2, trying to give the rook some time to get into h1 and it may seem at least for a second that white has successfully stopped black's attacking chances but we're now going to take the queen on f8 and yes being a rook down we're able to play knight f3 with check followed by knight g1 and we simply win the game now if the king was on c2 here black would be completely losing but because the queen stopped white from playing king e2 and was forced to play king d2 we played knight f3 with check bring our knight to g1 and here the game continued with rook takes d6 and after h1 equals queen white resigned the game a beautiful game that really highlights the attacking chances that black has in this opening if you'd like to learn more about the theory 
behind the hippopotamus defense, click the video to the left. If you'd like to explore more chess openings in general, click the playlist to the right. Leave a comment below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.